Armbar Mastery Live. We're going all the way right now, you guys. Buckle up, get comfortable, because it's gonna be crazy. We were talking before this and I said, man, we could do a whole hour, hour and a half on just the final control of the arm lock. Just the end position. Yes. Because the question is, what is more difficult? Getting to the final control or from the final control keeping it to extending the arm? With keeping it I say extending the arm. Most of them have trouble getting it, right? They're not getting it and losing it a whole bunch. They're not yeah. even getting there. So we're gonna address both today, and we have some options, right? But rather than going too deep on any one aspect of this, our goal is to take you on a journey. Let's start basic, but then let's rapidly escalate to where you can see the complexities. And the reason why super seminars like this, where we go very deep on one subject all the way through, are very powerful, is because when you practice in normal, kind of conventional Brazilian jiu-jitsu setting of a group class of, you know, an hour, we typically allocate in one hour, you allocate four slices of practice because you have to factor in practice time, which means they have to drill the technique, you know, five, 10 minutes, and they gotta show the next move five minutes, then drill the next one 10 minutes. So in one hour, you get 15 minute cycles times four, which means four techniques can be taught. And that's very limiting. So right now, we don't have a clock because we're the ones who can stay here as long until this battery runs out, or until we feel like cutting. And there's nobody to drill while we're teaching, so we can kind of punch through much more in a super seminar format here than we would be able to do in a regular group class format where the clock is sometimes the biggest challenge. So let's start very basic. He don't mount on me. We have to assume that some of you guys joining us have really never done it's just basic spin, and then we'll get into the control when you land there. Just for the basic. So he don't mounted the most conventional arm lock in history. And then we'll go into different variations and this all the details and every all the layers. It's so robust, you guys. So the most conventional, well, the requirement for any straight arm lock or arm bar is that Hedon's hips land behind my shoulder tricep area. That's it. So the most basic arm locks are the ones where the person gives that opportunity by reaching for you. The most advanced arm locks are the ones that they don't give that opportunity and you have to create it. And then the next layer beyond that is when you create it not just by force and leverage, but you create it by deception, where you do one thing to create a reaction, and then you catch something else. And then the final, final layer in all of this, and really which is one of the most important layers, is the control once you get there, because getting there is only one piece of the puzzle, it's only half. Keeping it and finishing is the other half, and we hope to have time to explore all the layers with you guys today, with your permission. Thumbs up? Thumbs up. Let's do this. So, so, what do you think about doing the little tiptoe hop up, hop up? How when we were kids, we were taught. It's too this. hard, bro, for them. It's not too hard. Most ninety nine percent of them have done a little bit of jiu-jitsu. Okay. In basic combatives. We'll do the so basic one. Basic combatives. We teach this. The person extends their arms. We put both hands on the chest, going over one arm, lifting up the opposite leg. Now, as my knee opens, my shoulders rotate, and with all the weight on the chest, it allows allows my back leg to fly and then to land. And then I hear my hands slide from his chest up his arm. And as I fall back slowly, I have double wrist control, legs tight, heels tight, knees tight, feet heavy. And now I raise my hips up slowly, stretching his elbow. So, final control yeah. is, we'll get there one more time, but both hands in the chest, over the arm you wanna catch, Set up step, open your and some, knee. And some common mistakes as we kind of dabble here, as we just kind of get through the basics. The most common mistakes right here, right, regarding this leg, if you have trouble stepping around the head, it's because your hips feel tight. And your hips feel tight because this knee and toes are pointed north like this. Now, he don't, his hips are very restricted. He's not going to be able to step around very mm -hmm. smoothly. But watch his heel and his toes and his knee. Look how open that foot and that knee are, which really open his hips. And then we really recommend this pivot. This one, two, three pivot is a great detail. One. one. Two, and now, which how wide, three. And look how his hips slam into my shoulder tightly when he spins, putting him in the closest possible sitting position because, let's rotate a little. When you land right here, if your hips are even a little separated from my shoulder, like that, which can often happen during a lazy spin, they're gonna rip your elbow to the ground and you're not gonna get it back. They're gonna really tuck this right here. It's probably more important than grabbing the arm. Right. Sitting close. Go again from this angle. So you can see how your hips touch so tight. Sitting close, his 
my hands, my hip positioning is more important than my hands and oh what they're goodness. doing. Look. Obviously, my hands are helping me spin. Look how tight. Like, Look how tight his hips are. Pull your arm out. You see that? Like my legs, my hips being closed, my heels being tight, and then my hands join the party. Versus, imagine my hips being a little late, my hands being here because my arm, my two arms are not enough to stop his elbow from going to the ground. Now my hip positioning and my snug legs, he can't pull to the ground, and then my arms will come in soon after to increase the control. So now, as to the final control, hips tight, heels tight, feet heavy, I'm gonna, both hands are gonna hold his wrist, my back is on the ground, my shoulders are off the ground. If you sit up too much, it's too much work. But we're here, both hands are holding his wrist, knees are bent, knees together. He might wanna push my knee off his head. Boom, can't. I don't let him do that, but I keep my knees together. He might try to sit up, I keep my feet very heavy, nailed to the ground. He might try to pull his bottom shoulder right here away to pull his elbow to the floor. My heels are pulling him in close. Now, on top of that, my wrist control. If I hold his wrist whatever way, if I hold like this, know that the most common reaction for this person is to bring their hand to their head. When I say head, I mean head, chest. He wants to bring it to his body. But relax, bringing it just straight in the middle is not as common because it just, relax, I just pulled it from there. So he's gonna try to run a different path and that path is to his head. So because of that, my hand on the side of his head grabs his wrist, north. My north hand, meaning his head is north, his legs are south, grabs north on his arm. This is north, this is south. So there's two norths and south. So my north hand grabs on top and then my other hand grabs on the bottom. Not only does it grab it, but I do a slight rotation this way, already anticipating his want to bring his hand to his head. And now, heels tight, I hold. I keep his arm just, how does your arm feel? Safe. Zero pain. I know that if I pull one half an inch or an inch down, now it's tight. So I hold it up just a little bit. And the question is this, is how often do I land in that position um, and control the person for 10, 20 plus seconds? Meaning I catch the arm lock, and I hold for here for 10, 20 seconds. I never tap someone in the first five, 10 seconds of getting here. And the reason why I don't is because so much is possible for this person, even in this stage right now, or if he's holding hands, even more is possible. So for me to rush to break this grip or to rush to stretch his arm, I'm missing out on an opportunity to feel and to experience the things that this person may do. And if some of you are thinking, those of you that had less experience, you're thinking, what could he possibly do from here? Please teach me that. Is that what Armbar Mastery is about? No, you're gonna figure it out on your own because you are gonna get here. Go ahead, escape. <clears throat> See, he's not giving us that much because he's, um, he knows. He knows, he's been there a few times. <laughs> so he knows that it's not even worth the energy right now. But what I want you to do is, imagine you catch somebody's arm, assuming you've already tapped that person before, you've already got that off your checklist, they're yes. already marked off. The next time you catch them, wait 10, 15 seconds, they're gonna feel your protecting of their arm. Yes. And give them permission to attempt whatever they have in mind to escape. Right. And then as they attempt it, it's gonna, you're gonna feel it. And when you feel it, you're gonna experience it. And then without even being told what to do to their behaviors, you're gonna, in the moment, you're gonna, you're gonna find it yourself. Safety disclaimer, if you're this person, you can be as gentle as you want. But if you're in my position, you should never bank on or take for granted their gentility of my arm control. I, I don't know this guy. He could well, be a he don't influence spiritual master of jujitsu who doesn't want to hurt anybody, or he could be some psychopath who's stressed out because he was locked out for so long from coronavirus. Now he gets back and wants to break arms. I don't know who this person is. So whenever I get caught, lock my arm up, and he here, he kicked my bicep away. Look, he kicks my arm away, and he gets here. I mo hey, tap. So Immediately, now, I resist. I resist. Just a safety tip for the rest of your life. Most, you get, most of you will know who's arm locking you. Though. Who knows, bro? And if you know that they're safe, then play the game. But just the point 10%. is, as you pull this, just a real quick tip. Pull it back. As you, I'm not going to be relaxed. I'm tense. Tap. I don't tap to the pressure of the break. 
I tap to the creation of the compromised position. You tap to the loss of the control. Of the safety the and safety. protection. As soon as I, my protection is compromised, I tap. Because I know that one hip thrust could break my arm and I don't trust this guy with my life. And when we talk about self-defense, defend yourself from the accidental arm break that happens because you didn't tap soon enough or you trusted they were going to hold it for 15 seconds. So take that one from both sides. Excellent. So this is the basic arm lock and some basic control principles from the mount. It's very important to give this a full mindset for today. Let's just explore other positions of the equally basic variations so they can see how they're all essentially the same. Want to get in my guard? Look, so from in the guard, which is the upside down mount. Look, Guido's hands are anywhere near my, the more exposed they are, and uh, the, more, the more extended the arms are, the bigger the gift. Got it. We have a question from the crowd right now that we want to address because it's pretty serious. What do you think about that? People believe sometimes that they're too old and that they're too out of shape well, and they can't do jujitsu. Well, yeah, right? and here's what or someone... Or they wish they would have started much earlier. Because if you start when you're nine, maybe it would have kept you from growing old and from get growing, uh, gaining weight. Yes, true. But someone feels, or someone's saying right now, and posting the question, that they were told they were too fat to oh, start. It says I was told. Yes. Is it? Yes. They were told they were too fat. Or did he feel he was too fat? Either way, it's the same thing. If you told it, they told or feel, and you wrote it, you believe it. I'm too old. He's saying it. I'm too old and too fat to do jujitsu. Well, you're wrong, sir. There is somebody older and there's somebody fatter. Bro, there's a lot older and a lot fatter, and they're loving every single day they go to class, and they are miserable yeah. because of coronavirus right now, and they can't go to class, but that's another mindset they need to work on. Now, he would like to have discovered Jesus earlier. Yeah. yeah, he thinks that if he would have discovered it earlier, he would have been able to do it. You're wrong, sir. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you would have discovered it earlier, <laughs> when you're 11 years old, you're right, sir. But here's seen, it might have made a difference. This doesn't mean that discovery it now doesn't mean you, you can still get started even now. What age is too old? There isn't. The rest of you that are viewing, what age? Type in the age that is too old to start jujitsu. Yes. Is it 57? Is it 64? Or everyone just start putting their ages in the comments. Everyone put their age in the comment right now because... Yeah, I don't think that there's an age that's too old to start. Listen, the, the guy who thinks he's too old, or woman who thinks they're too old or too fat to start, needs to see some weight limits and some ages. Put your weight and your age. And if you're really big, Listen. put your weight really big so that this guy sees it. All right, let's get back to work. Let's go to the guard. So here's the upside down mount. The hands are on the chest and face area. Here's what's crazy. The same way when Kido was mounted on me, mount on me please. Look, and the hands are up on his throat. The higher my hands are, look at this. Lower, 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 harder. The higher my hands are, the more accessible my shoulder and armpit are for his hips to get in here. The lower they are, the harder it is to get in there. This is true for the guard as well. That's why we say elbows tucked in is a way of defending arm bars. That's why we say keep your friends close, keep your elbows closer. Keep your enemies close, keep your elbows closer. Keep your friends close. Keep your enemies, enemies closer, closer, keep your elbows the closest, even closer than any enemy, especially if they're the one grappling with you. I love that. It's got to be a t-shirt. So, <laughs> so now he owns in my guard. He owns mountain. Let's go with my guard, please. So when he's in my guard, look at, keep your elbows tight. Look, there's no arm lock. It's going to be very difficult to compromise his arm. But as they creep up, go creep up, creep up. I just posted a Gracie Challenge video the other day uh, of some of the old school Gracie Academy Challenge matches, right? Beautiful video. And in there, one of the final matches against our friend Mauricio Zingano, who passed away, great guy. So one of our good friends uh, was grappling this guy, or fighting this guy, and the guy at the very end reached for my neck, very determined, and leaned over like this. And Mauricio instantly switched, boom, and he got his hips around perfectly. Right here, heels tight, he slid to the wrist, everything tight and break. So it was the classic straight arm lock from the guard from Gracie Combatives. Basics, you guys, lesson number 19. So once again, the hands are up on the chest or throat. Look what we're gonna do. We're gonna come under, you can grab the arm with one, you can frame with the other. Foot on the hip, create 90 degrees. That's the most important part. And the same 90 degrees, but look at this, this is the key right here. Hip to shoulder, you guys. That same hip to shoulder we got from the mount, we're getting it. And that's only accomplishable by turning 90 degrees. And you can turn 90 degrees by using your foot and pivot and bite, that's 90. Or you can use 90 degrees by going under someone's leg, framing their neck, and now using my hand to really help facilitate that angle, or a combination of the two, where I grab the leg, do this, use my foot, kick off, and turn, and then step over. In all cases, we need 90 degrees, hip to shoulder, tight. Pull your arm out. Can't, it's so tight. You see or, 
Go back, or sometimes you put your foot on my hip, grab my arm again, how you did, put it on the hip, freeze, go back a little bit. Let's say that he's, think he's too fat, too much weight. I use my knee right here, and I can even move you. Now freeze, I can also, say right there, I can also move your leg up high and move my head a little bit, now step around. There you uh, go. So even big boy with and the belly, you can still practice if you have a partner who wants to help. It's, I want you to land in the position, right. in the final position. Feel and it. I'm gonna help you 40%. And then after a week, I'm gonna help you 30%. And then 20%, and then 10%, because I need your body to understand where it has to go. And that is the beauty of having, that like you just mentioned, a partner that wants to help you. Dude, here's the beauty of you guys. Like, you know, when you learn how to surf, oh, I'm too big, I'm too old, I'm too fat to learn how to surf. You might be right. Because there's some variables here that you can't control. The ocean, the waves, uh, you may not be able to stabilize on the moving thing and there's no way. Okay, so there may be possible that it's not possible for you. However, jujitsu is the wave that everyone can surf. Yeah. I don't even know if that's true about surfing. Hold on, bro. It's a good analogy, though, and you just ruined it. No, 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 no. I'm saving you because you're about to go too deep. I know, but I had to use something to compare. Got it, okay. Evandro, it was pretty deep. Let's be honest, bro. I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sell surfing right now. I'm trying to sell jujitsu. Yeah. Go ahead, though. Come on, bro. That's a good one. Go ahead and tell them why they... It was pretty dope. No, you're right. Everyone can surf. You get a nice coach, a huge board. All kinds Go of to Waikiki. all around the world. Go to Waikiki with the smallest little boomer. You're going to find your way. You get a good coach, you're going to make it happen. Here's the deal, though. Jiu-Jitsu is the wave everyone can surf because we can change jujitsu. We can literally control the wave like Kelly Slater's wave pool. You press a button, it's a different wave for a different surfer. I've been there. It was the best day of my life besides my kids, my wife, my thing, my brother, my birth, my born, my thing, my things, GU, the whole thing. You guys, it was amazing. So back to this. The point is you can do it because we can modify it. He just showed some great adaptations that can be done by a good training partner who wants to help you, which is the case at any good school, including all the certified training centers around the world. Listen, the reason sometimes why you think you can't do jujitsu, and many of you, that are watching besides the person that is overweight, you will, there will reach a day where you believe, oh, I can't do this. And it may be because of flexibility, it may be because of endurance, who knows, you're not training often enough, you're getting submitted too much, whatever the reason is. But the main reason why you believe you can't do it is because you have an image in your mind of what it believes to do jujitsu. And that image, that is what needs to be adjusted mm -hmm. because Oftentimes, what you believe it means to do jujitsu is this. Now, the reason why Andrew Gracie was able to do jujitsu in his 90s is because what he believed it meant to do jujitsu, it was so minimal. It was so minimal. Like, you, but it was also so maximum in a different way. It was just so different than well, what someone else might believe. It was not so it was elaborate. Yeah, it's true. And it was not so explosive and not so physically demanding. Yes. It was very basic yeah, it was the, it was the most it was the bare minimum there is. that you can do to stay safe so because he understood that and he he tapped into that and, and not only that but he's somebody who, when he says hey if you do this for 30 seconds or for three minutes that is you doing jujitsu somebody else who's 23 years old might look at that and say that's not jujitsu because they're that's confused true. because they think that wow. jujitsu is only the most extreme most athletic displays of the art so again sometimes just shifting what you believe it means to do jiu-jitsu is all you need to be able to do jiu-jitsu. Let's shift it. Here we go. So from the guard, one more time. We need 90 degrees. How do we achieve that? Legs, hips, angles. However it happened, we just got to get that 90 and get this bite. The same bite we had on the ground, we need elevated. It's a little more challenging now because I'm fighting against gravity versus having him on his back. He's still in a strong, kneeling, dynamic position. But here's a great detail to minimize that. The heel's power is tripled if he can post his back foot on the ground and do this. Because now he's able to go over my neck, go over heel and compromise my neck and stack me up, which would make the whole thing crumble potentially. So when we land right here, one amazing detail from the wrist control, even if you have your ankles crossed, always making sure that the, the neck side, the north leg, is underneath the crossing leg. But here's the key, cross or not. What I want to do is take both my legs and I'm going to empty the water by doing this, mm -hmm. now post your back foot. Mm -hmm. He can't, but if I do this, he can lean a little bit up, freeze. So I'm gonna take, I envision like a glass of water and I'm pouring it out in the, in the, water, in the, in the grass over here. I'm gonna empty the water. 
Now start driving up a little, put a little, look at that. It's completely empty, he can't, and that buys just enough time for the hyperextension of the elbow. So the same way there are systems of control mechanisms, when Hedon is laying down, and I'm out here, and he has my arm locked up from the mount, the same way there's different control concerns there, there are equal concerns when they're in your guard, and it's just addressing some of those. Now, something else that um, Fabrizio Verdun just talked about maybe a month ago, was that when you land right here, notice how most people when they catch an arm lock, even right here, look at his body positioning. His head is off the ground. Now, let me get up again. So from here, minimal legs, medium legs, yeah. if your head goes to the ground and now connect to the ground, go ahead. Yes, versus pick your head up. I see. So it, putting your head down kind of anchors you, it grounds him to some degree. He's connected, yeah, uh, it's totally different. A little more to push off of. So be aware of the, the reason why you curl your head is because there's an energy of wanting to see what you're working with. Yes. Which makes sense. Sometimes you do want to see, but sometimes forget about looking and prepare for what's coming next, which is that stack. So on top of, would you say dump the water? Empty the water. Empty the water, head you down, down great detail. connected. Thank Fabrizio for that one. So he don't take my back, please. So now, another position. We have the front mount, we have the upside down mount, AKA the guard, and now we have the back mount. What is the unifying factor in all of these? He don't let the, the attacker or the good guy's legs are around the bad guy's hips. When he don't was mounted on me, his legs were around my hips. Look, he's here, right? His legs are over mine. Well, so they're free. They're free and they can be used to break someone's arm. When he was in my guard, my legs were around his hips, which is the upside down mount. Got it. Boom. So and now my legs are not free right now. Me, no. for example, I can't armbar you. No, I'm mounted on you. There you go. There, he cannot armbar me. Great observation. This is important, you guys. When we talk about the armbar mastery concept, anytime your legs are around their torso, you have the upper hand or upper leg, and you can do that. Now, from the back mount, we talked about this in our back mount mastery seminar, but we'll briefly mention it here in the context of today's discussion. If he has the over under, in order to do an arm lock from the back, he has to go to the underhook side. He must. It's not an option. So from the underhook side, he's gonna fall. We call this the weak side to see why. Gracie Combatives, lesson number three, four, five. Look, over under, he's gonna fall this way. Boom. And now from here, he's gonna create the same 90 degrees that we created from the mount and the back mount. Go ahead. Boom, boom, boom. There's your 90, there's the hip to shoulder. And, the, and this, interestingly, wouldn't you say, you know, these adjustments are beautiful, but it's almost like, when we talk about hip to shoulder, it's the most important thing to achieve. Yeah. In both other positions, our hips are out and we have to bring them in to find the shoulder. In this case, our hips are so deep in and we have to somewhat bring them out to, to find the shoulder. And to give space for our leg to pass. But they're overly in, you know yes. what I'm saying? In a unique way. So it's like this arm lock from the back is almost the easiest position mm -hmm. to get your hips behind someone's shoulder from if that makes sense, because it's already there. All you gotta do is climb the tree and change that angle a little bit, and you're right there. So with a few steps, it can be very effective for you guys. One more time with a brief breakdown here and some common mistakes. So again, underarm, <clears throat> fall to the side. I put my foot right here on his hip, and now as I even extend my arm right here to kind of lighten his body up, I punch this. My hips punch out this way, and the bottom leg comes across his chest. This is the setup step. Remember from the mountain, we did a setup step under the arm. Hug. And now I frame and I make him look away. So critical. I know that when he looks away, that if he's like this, go ahead, the chances of him getting up, go to your knees, are much greater, go back. But if by him looking away, he's not even thinking about how he can go to his knees. Frame, and remember, when you frame, you leg. You don't frame and wait. The moment that the frame is in the position, boom, the leg follows right after. And when the leg lands, back to what Henry discussed from the guard, it's the same dumping of the water uh, concept where my legs, my feet drive to the ground. Because even from here, if he's in tank, he can get up. But if my feet drive to the ground, go ahead, and I connect my shoulders, my head to the mat, my legs become very heavy. Excellent. Last one here, and then we'll talk about the next layer. Is the next layer breaking the grip? No. No, the next layer is going to be doing A to catch B. Boom, boom, and then boom. There you go. So, here's the deal, you guys. Getting the hips behind the shoulders, right? And when this becomes difficult is when the person you're training against knows that that's what you want to do. So there are two ways to expose the back of their 
tricep and shoulder to your pelvis, which is what needs to happen. Now, there are more advanced ways than what we showed right now and positions from where you can attack the arm lock. But these are the three most rudimentary and they can get pretty complex when the person who's defending resists. And we're gonna show layer two and potentially 2.5 from all of these, starting from the mount. You know, uh, if the person now, and assuming you just wanna go for the arm lock, let's show two variations here. Let's show one where you just force what you wanna accomplish without permission. And I'll show one afterwards where I do something else to make them give it to me, which is another layer of the same idea. But the first one, let's talk about that kind of here, standard, and then the, basically the belly and Superman pressure to the north. Am I yeah. framing yeah. the neck? You can frame a little. Yeah, you can frame a little, but still, it's resisted, but you're going to force it. Yeah. I think frame's legal. I mean, whatever. So but the guy has just a tight elbow. That one is still hitting the principle. That one, yeah. It's still a one, two. Yeah, but less than what I'm going to show. So, gi or no gi, this concept of framing the person's neck, anchoring somebody's shoulder, and then slicing your arm across their neck. You see how he tapped right there? If he had no arms, this would be sufficient to you know, pretty much render him unconscious. Now, when I anchor this and I put pressure, the most common response is to grab this arm for two reasons. One is because people learn the trap and roll. And, but two is because the angle of this hand to simply just, because if you're being, people, this is a common response is to pull to save your neck. So I'm here, I'm putting pressure. Now, how low his elbow is? Is it low or is it high? The more experienced somebody is, the lower it is. And you know what's crazy? The lower it is, it's almost even better. <laughs> so, a little pressure. And now, I'm going to slide my hip over here around his elbow, putting my hand down over his face. And now I invert my leg and I lean my body weight. From here, all my weight is to this side, allowing my left leg to spin very lightly. So, once again, Anchoring the shoulder, pressuring the neck. Now, if I need to get my belly button on the back side of his arm. So it's important that not only do I slide my knee up, but I do like a little bit of a circular. I go around his elbow. So there are two things. There's one is how far I move his elbow by driving my arm, and then two is me moving my body around. So one, and then I move around it. As soon as I get around it, my knees, this thigh and this knee, this knee, this arm, everything that's here hugs him. Now this is not enough. He can walk his legs this way, and he slip his elbow to the ground, go back. So as soon as I get around, my hand goes here, and not just any hand, because if it's like this, there's no weight on my hand. So it's my hand with this, with weight. And now by leaning this way, it allows my leg to extend, rotate my heel, and then I lean. Now don't get me wrong, in that rotation period, there's a little less weight on the hand, but it's okay, because I already neutralized his elbow tuck attempt. And now I lean, and then from here, second leg flies, and we land. Good? Very good. Let me try that. So the frame, gi or no gi. Yeah. The bone. So my elbow is right here. It's, you know, when you just want to transfer to the north right here, you guys, when it's time to come up and come around, put, you're pushing off this toe, right? Your actually foot stays, and you're like shooting that knee up. And then you're coming in tight, inverting. And now lots of pressure on this hand here. Leaning, extending this leg out the back. If you sit too much on this heel, you're gonna get tipped over the back right here. So post, lean and drive. And then with that leg extended, comes around, making sure you lean your head to the south to make it easier for the leg to come around and then we attack from here. Great, so that's one method, right? Is where you literally are just more forcing. That's one approach. Um, their elbow's tight, you want the elbow, so you go get it, okay? It's gonna be harder, there's no doubt. Because when they're pushing this arm up and away, and they're leaving all kinds of
pulled like a, like a snow plow, like just coming through, grinding through, and just putting pressure, neutralizing the opponent. Hands up. In this case, I want to focus on the actual complete deception where I push this arm to the ground. Then Hito has a choice. Go back, do nothing, do nothing, in which case this becomes very serious very, rare. very quickly, right? Or do what your heart is telling you to do, which is to go grab it and bring it mm. back. Especially people with bigger shoulders and chest and strength right here. They hate when their arms are against their will, forced away from their body. And they believe so strongly in their ability to bring it back. Their strength, yeah, they really mm -hmm. believe in the strength. So I do this Americana setup with the intention of not catching it. As soon as I drive it, at the same time, my foot steps up to his shoulder, my leg steps around and I hug with the north hand in the <laughs> opening and I go right here. Okay, one more time. So again, when it comes to armbar mastery, the idea here is simple. I want to do X to catch Y. In other words, I'm doing a different submission in order to catch the submission that we want. Whereas previously, we didn't have to do a different submission to do it. So when I go for one and I create this dilemma for Hidon where he has to defend or he gets caught in that one or he gets caught in this one, now keep my weight here, step my foot up in the shoulder, the same detail you guys saw before from the basic variation where the hand was up, and now swing that leg. And then as soon as I swing, my weight stays on this hand and the other north hand hugs because it's more free and has less weight on it. And then right when you land, you can even pull this arm up and lock your legs underneath. Never a bad idea as you go down because now I have his back arm trapped as well. And as a general rule, you don't want to cross your legs from this seated position because if you accidentally cross your legs over his arms, it becomes very easy for him to just bail underneath and slip out. But that rule does not apply if you cross your legs underneath the person's shoulder. It's actually a great anchoring mechanism. Keeps his arm from slipping out because he'll maybe sometimes, if you let him and your feet are separate, they can kind of elbow escape your foot, put it in the guard right there. And those type of sneaky slip unders are negated by the fact that I'm now under his arm right here and fully trapped. So crossing the legs, if their legs reach, this is totally acceptable, right, considering what's going on here. So this idea of deception, go for one to catch the other is very applicable when it comes to arm locks. Any other mount uh, variations of that? Well, there's the cross choke one. Sit up, please. Sit. Let's do a couple variations of this now so they can see how going for something else to catch the arm lock is also very common from the mount. He goes for this choke now, I start to over defend, and then it's exposed the same way, right? Yes. Let's show what the choke is so they know what we're working for, and then we'll show how it connects. So my hand's in the collar. This hand right here, I want to insert my hand underneath here, or I want to come over like this. So one hand is in the collar, second hand either slides under, hand inside, or over thumb inside. And then both of these, I can apply He'll actually choke pressure. me unconscious, and he'll do that by closing the distance, right? So once he locks it, He's gonna lay low, put his weight on me, and then drive his chest down. And then by pulling on both lapels, he's actually plugging both of my carotid arteries, and I'm rendered unconscious in a six to 10 seconds, give or take. So now, I don't want that to happen. So the second he does this, more often than not, if I know jujitsu, I'm now thinking, no, that other hand's not coming in. Now, this is not only him knowing jujitsu, this is him knowing Eli Gracie, right? This whole idea of stopping the other hand, this is very advanced, and this is discussed um, and Blue Belt Stripe 2. Yeah, I don't know where exactly, but this is all out there. This information exists for you to learn. And your instructors all know this also. Most of them will if they're a certified training center. But this idea of blocking this, obviously is very advanced. If I bring my arm over, mm -hmm. your other hand should grab it and this elbow stays tucked in. Yes. The problem is, sometimes I intentionally come underneath with an energy that engages this arm. Mm. Once this arm is engaged, once I come over, it should relax and the other hand should grab it. The problem is once that hand is engaged, it's difficult to release that which it is occupied doing. So I come under, boom, boom. Beautiful. And then I go over. So I trust, I know, I know that if if I just simply go from here and I have to go release it, you can release it. But I know that if I push a little bit, I can then guide him out yeah. into this my danger zone. Yeah, because once he goes under, I stiffen my arm. And then my lizard brain is like, no, you're not coming in. So then when he takes that lizard wow. brain and he goes over, it stays rigid for a few seconds. The same way the lizard's tail keeps wiggling after it falls off, it's still a little bit wiggly. You know what I'm talking about? When you, a lizard's tail falls off, it keeps moving. For a little while. That lizard's tail has a life still to it. <laughs>
<laughs> you don't like that analogy? No, because you said lizard brain. <laughs> but lizard brain means amygdala, like the hijack. Right? No, that's not why the tail moves, though. Whoa. Because of the amygdala. <laughs> You know, the lizard brain. I'm gonna do with that. Don't get mad at my two lizard analogies in the same sentence. Why they don't even connect. They don't need to. They're two. I could have said surfing and lizard in the same sentence, but they don't have to connect. They just make sense. The lizard tail. My lizard tail right here. It's going. It's like me comes over. I shouldn't follow it. The lizard tail shouldn't be wiggling, but it does. You come over. It's still gonna be rigid. Boom. And then show them the setup step from there. So the setup step as I go one. The moment my arms, my leg goes. Together. My, my setup step happens with my leg. Now, maybe 10% of the time, the arm won't be there. And I'll spin for nothing. Interesting. But most of the time. It is. You can draw the person out. No see, problem. The alternative is to go under and then come over, please. But don't do your step. So put the hand over. And then now that you see it's there, do your step down. Too late. They're going to defend. Too much time. Right? Exactly. Yes. It's important to recognize that. So it's almost like he do not somewhat has to shoot blindly. Hoping that the lizard brain will connect and follow and he'll it'll be there when he needs it, you know? Well, the question is how many seconds will the arm be in this very exposed place? Before I recognize yeah. that it shouldn't be there. Very right. few, you guys. Very few. Remember, friends close, enemies closest, enemies close, elbows closer. Submissions. It, it's all about whether or not he dip, tucks his elbow in or I catch it. It has to do with the, the, does he recognize the danger his arm is in before I do? In this case, no, because I'm putting his arm into that position. So I have that advantage that I'm forcing him there. So I go under, boom, boom, here. And then my leg's in a position to do it again. Very nice. And you guys, listen, what's crazy is that this is the same as the basic standard arm lock combative, lesson number whatever, hands over, foot up. And then with all the Look weight here, the, the only difference is instead of the weight being two hands on the sternum, it's one on the collar and one on the bicep, which means... As, Essentially, look at the two arms right here. Two arms. One, two. Now let go. Put both your hands on my chest. It's the same. One, two. Go back. One, so, two. So. But except this time, it's my arm. Instead of your arm and your arm, it's your arm and my arm. But as long as you have two pillars to pivot on, you're happy. You don't care whose arms they are. Now, my fist is lower versus my hand here. A little more elevated. I, I am more elevated with my hand on your chest which makes the lean of my head even that much more important and the inversion of my leg. So I'm here, I come under, huh? boom, one, and then now I lean. He leans very dramatically to the south, you guys, to allow that outside leg to pivot so freely. If you have trouble with your spins and you've been training for one month or one year or 10 years, if you have trouble with your spins, it has nothing to do with your limited flexibility, right? Yeah, the flexibility has to do with your weight distribution has to do with weight distribution and hip angles mm -hmm. that you allow. So, for example, if I was sitting like this and I wanted to spin this leg around, I would not be able to. But the second I sit like this, I can spin that leg around. So, opening one leg permitted the other leg to spin. So, if you have any trouble, try the same exercise, right? If you're sitting like this, try to step this leg around. You can't. Your leg doesn't open. Your hips are trapped right here. But the second that you do this, now what is this comparable to? It's comparable to the setup step. So when he don't have his hands in the chest and he opens this knee, he's essentially creating that spin opportunity. So much so that when I have my fist in the collar on the ground, when I lean, yes. it probably becomes maybe 10% of my weight is here. Where's the rest? Everywhere else. On the rib cage with this hamstring, it, the right hand there. on the ground becomes very light when you're halfway into your spin. Because you're also leaning some weight on my, he's leaning on my chest with this. So boom, watch, he's gonna spin that leg. Give it right now. Right now, it's the light. weight is on your arm. It's here. Yeah, it's on my foot right here. And then yeah. it transfers to your hamstring on my chest at the halfway point. So wherever it has to go, because I don't care Where the about is. anything other than is my body in position for my leg to spin smoothly. I see, you don't care how heavy anything else is as long as the leg mm -hmm. is light. Now here's what's beautiful, you guys. He don't, this is the mount variation, getting my guard. Look at this, you guys, look at this. Upside down mount, same thing. Let's say he don't, hide your elbows real tight. Hide, hide. I, I want this, I, want, I can't. If you want the elbow, stop going for the elbow. This is level two. Level one is, they do something to your face, you take the gift. Thank you very much, peace out, see you later. Level two is, they know you, they want, you want your hips behind the shoulders, so they defend against it. So check this out. When that happens, open up one collar, get a deep collar grip on a cross grip here with one hand. What does this look like, you guys? It looks like the upside down mount. I'm mounted on Hidon, and I have the same grip. Like. 
what it is. It is the upside down mount. So now that I'm here across collar grip and I have this free hand, what do I need to do? Same as you know, I need to kind of create a situation where there's a threat, enough of a threat here so that I can catch the same angle ball. Okay? So I need him to overcommit on the defense of the second choking hand. I go under, he blocks. I come over, he blocks. I try to go under, he blocks. And go, and then I finally go. And now he stiff arms this because he's worried about let go. He's worried about this. Closeness is his enemy. When I get two hands on the collar and I pull him in, he's going to be compromised. So he knows that. So as I come over, if I get close to it, he already starts to stiffen this arm. The key, like we mentioned the last time, is how long will his arm remain gifted before he recognizes he's in a compromised position. That's the only thing to think about in all of this. We've got to understand that he may not want to give that arm out for too long. So you almost have to go for this with the objective of, right, like already creating it just to be able to catch it. So I just did a big spin as if this was for the choke, <laughs> but it's not. I just want this for the arm to be stiff right now. Go ahead, pushing away. And now both my legs can come up and find the home. And I land with the choke in place. My legs bite and then instantly I hug the wrist because I want to prevent him from hugging his own bicep. I hug your own bicep? Like that. Either my bicep hugs his wrist, go back. My bicep hugs his wrist or his bicep hugs his wrist. And if his hugs, it's much worse for me. So I bite, I get that early lockup where I hug this, now he can't. Then I rip my other hand out of the collar, grab the wrist, grab the wrist, the way he don't show up. Remember north hand, grabbing further out, south hand, grabbing on the inside, heels tight, empty the water here. Go back, go back, I'm sorry. You pick. I wanted to show your head detail. Mm -hmm. So from here, empty the water, stack me up, use the head to drive that bucket into the water, into the floor here, emptying the water, keep this tight, heels tight, cross if you need to, pressure. If they fall, fall over, boom, right away. His shoulder is too far away. So if ever they fall from the guard, mm -hmm. keep it tight, use your heels, do a sit up and push the hand and then jump your hips right in and then relay down everything tight. The same way we talked about wrist turning to the south, mm -hmm. heels tight, knees tight, hips tight. Excellent. Okay. So once again, from the guard, if they gift it, thank them. If they're strangling you, thank them. If they're grabbing your hair or your face, best thing possible because they're gifting it. We went very quick. Go ahead. If they're not gifting it, it's time for you to start probing other submission, other threats, so that they go, man, these other things are happening right here. I got to deal with these. And if I don't, I'm going to get choked or Americana arm locked or cross choked, right? So you have to create that dilemma where if they don't respect the setup threat, they will get submitted by the setup threat. But when they do respect it, they get submitted by the follow-up threat, which in this case for today's discussion is the arm bar from one angle or another. So we kind of, we kind of merged, we kind of skipped an important phase. For example, if they do want to become very proficient at arm locks, how long does it take? Just fast spins, loose hips, months. Yes. Months, four months, six months, just arm lock. Basically when Movement. someone's giving you the arm lock, even somebody trying to strangle you, pinning you down, yes. pushing up on your chest, it takes time. Six months, let's just say, a lot of arm bars. And then we're saying now, if they're not giving you the arm, probe it by attacking the neck, for example. Yes. Those two examples. The thing is this, you, you can't just go from not really ever doing cross chokes to saying, okay, you know, I'm a year and a half into sparring, I'm gonna start probing the neck. It's almost like you have to now stop arm locks and for six months, eight months, 12 months, <clears throat> just do cross chokes. Because what's gonna happen is there's a, it's almost like people, you're going to gain a reputation and there's going to be a respect that is given to you that when you put a hand on the collar, it means something. Now, it doesn't mean that I, for example, if I roll with somebody in another country, I put a hand on their collar, they don't need to have been choked by me four or five times to respect that hand yeah. because they simply give me that respect because of my experience. Well, I don't know, I think they give the choke the respect and know that you are a valid choker. Oh, I agree. That they, well, they give me the respect. Well, they give the choke is respectful and we combine. Yeah, combined. it's true, true, 50, 50. The thing is that there are people, for example, that put a hand in someone's collar and you don't even, and fear. the person on top is like, they just break the grip, no they just posture a little yes, bit. Yes. They don't quite treat it the same. They don't block the second bi the bicep. Right. And they don't pause their guard. They continue to plow through the guard pass. Right. So that might be happening to you. You, you might be trying to do cross shoulders right now, but people are not pausing their pass or 
what their plan. They're, they're not fearful of it at all because it's not. They're real. not addressing the second hand. The setup has to be real. Well, the setup, but also your conviction and your different ways. Not only the setup, but your ability to finish. Yeah. Like when you put both hands in someone's collar, and you turn your wrist, what kind of things might they do when you're when you're choking them? They might posture away for guard, for example. So your ability to keep a good grip, to stay close, your the endurance that you have in your grip itself. So these things that have to happen over time. And then once you do that, then you almost reintroduce the combination of choke threat <clears throat> to arm lock finish. And because it's, put it this way, is the choke threat, is it even fake? No. It's not. In both cases of mount and guard. They're all of them are real. So, now, the reason why I can come under and, and do the over and set up step from the mount at the same time is because I already gathered information that that person is a little overly rigid and fearful of being choked. So I take that and I do two steps at once. Yes. But if they didn't, let's say their arms were a little hesitant, choked. I would not even think armbar, I would crush right through. Yes. And because they know that I'm capable of that, they become overly rigid to prevent that choke, giving the arm. So what we are discussing, today the choke, the choke has many roles, it's very yeah. much dynamic. Today the choke's being discussed in the context of using it to set up the armbar, because that's our focus for today's mastery seminar. Mm -hmm. However, what Hiron's pointing out is, is undeniable. The choke mastery. The choke mastery seminar is its own, and when you put a hand on the collar, it should mean Certain death analogy, it should mean guaranteed submission, if, submission finish. If not addressed, if not, right? if not addressed, it is a very serious threat. If not responded to in the way that would create the armbar opportunity, chances are something else it's is available. available. That original choke is there. If they do a little defense with the armbar, well, it's not right there. Well, because the choke is very there and you just don't see it. Very beautiful. And the same is true from the back mount. Let me get your back right here. So let's say I'm having trouble catching Hidon's arm from the back mount. His defense is just too good. Slide a little south. Look, so we're here, and maybe I just feel like, man, he's not gonna let me get the angle. He's just too aware, his hands are too smart. Look, so we get here, we peel, we grab, we go for the choke. He defends the neck, I keep working, and now I catch this. Now that I've trapped his arm, I'm only fighting against one arm, and now it's much easier to advance over there. So using a choke, to isolate one of his limbs, which brings another principle of limb isolation into the fight. The point is, I'm on the back. If I just go direct, right, his other hand may stop him from getting caught. It may mess me up. So to say, okay, I can't catch it direct. Let's use one submission to catch another. You slingshot his arm out, and that's after I sell this choke. He defends, well, and not. then boom. And are you selling it? I'm submitting it. I'm sending the choke. <laughs> he defends. Like grabbing my hand and pulling for real, then I slingshot his hand out, trap it. Now that his arm is out of the fight, I bring my blade in front of his neck, make him look away, bite high across the chest, and then when I feel ready, this leg comes right over with my hand, not my calf. He's gonna bust right through that. So from the arm trap, big frame, hip turn, hamstring, and immediate slap on the wrist, and then down we go. So whether it's back mount, whether it's full mount, whether it's guard, neon doing belly, A to create B, yes, neon belly. So this is interesting, and I think if there's a third level in this, right, and there are many more examples of doing something to set up and create the opportunity for the arm bar. This is classic one-two punch. Throw the jab, land the cross. Throw the cross, land the hook, right? But then there is also go for the arm bar to catch something else, right? That's the third level of arm bar mastery, where you don't just mm. set up the arm bar and then catch it. You mm. actually do this, you catch an arm bar, or you set up or you aim for one, to either sweep the person or to catch another submission that is only made available because of your armbar attempts. Good example, guard, is the most classic probably of all. Let me say breaking the grip is also a phase. Yeah, that's in I think terms of control, likelihood of control use. and final thing, but I think that for the yeah, that's true. But anyway, so let's say we go here. Let's say that now I right, so the armbar can be the it can be the it can be the the two out of one, two, or it can be the the two out of the one, two, three. two, three, right? It can be something that leads to something else. Mm -hmm. Very important to acknowledge its existence mm -hmm. in that realm, right? Let's say, for example, I'm here, I sell the choke, I go for this, I turn, I catch it, I hug. But he stacks me up a little bit and rips his arm right out. Boom, right away, right here, okay? And now we're here setting up the triangle, keeping him close, roll the leg over, and we got it, okay? So we can go from the arm lock attempt on purpose 
to catch it, right? And there are many variations of that. One is here where I catch his shoulder on purpose. This is kind of like a 50-50 triple threat position where I'm just kind of holding him almost, his shoulders trapped. I'm getting ready to step over his head. And at that any point during this, he step rips his arm out. I'm expecting it. And then I jump right back to triangle setup. And then I can get here, control the Notice head. how he's swimming my arm, swimming. He's knocking my arm to that side. He's not putting it across my body. He's doing that because he has long legs and because he needs to be fast. Well, and I'm also doing that because I know the person I'm dealing with is very advanced. Back to what I say, he needs to be fast. I need to be fast. I need because to be tight. I'm too good. If, if I try to do this, he's going to posture up and mess everything in my life. So the minute we land, he swam me hell. Now he can't push off my body with his hand. So I'm not so concerned with getting his arm across. I'm not as concerned with getting his arm across in a conventional triangle manner as I am with preventing him from escaping right now. Did you say you're not as concerned? Mm -hmm. you're, he's not concerned at all. No, I'm only concerned with preventing yeah. Hedon's escape. I treat this triangle setup as if I just achieved the mount. And the second you achieve the mount, what's your only priority? Keep the mount. That's it. Nothing else matters. Nothing, 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 nothing in the whole world. Just keep the mount. And if just keeping them out and preventing their escape is your only priority, then guess what? Pulling the arm across. Getting the arm across is the worst thing you can do at that instant when someone knows you. If they don't know jujitsu, then it doesn't matter because they don't know what they're defending against. But this seminar, we're getting to the ones, the two, the, 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 the skill, five. yeah, the skills, the skills for people who don't know jujitsu ended after the one, 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 all the one discussions. Now that we're in the twos and threes and back and forth, we're only using these combos because someone presumably is neutralizing our techniques with their knowledge of what we want to do to their joints. Very, very, very rare, but even from here, if he's holding hands, he can begin to, very, like I said, very rare, but if his hips move away a little bit and his shoulder pulls to the ground, if I lose this arm, there's an energy in my legs right here that as he gets up, get up, get up, get up, get up, right? I'm already up. Same. I'm thinking about the triangle. So that's, you know, similar principle of you lost the arm, you take the next thing. Yeah, and sometimes you lose it. Sometimes you went for it hoping that they reacted to it. You feel me? Sometimes, the same way you go for the choke, almost like, okay, give me that arm. Like you're, you're assuming they're gonna give you the arm. You can go for an arm and assume they're gonna respond in a way that will create the additional opportunity mm -hmm. for you. And, uh, and then you seize that additional opportunity, whatever yeah. that might be. Let's do some Q&A. We can do some Q&A, but I think we want to address what you want to talk about in terms of control and grips. Yeah, I mean, we have to do that first. I think they want to know. In terms of things that are important, because what we have to ask ourselves is, you, you did it right, we did it in phase one, two, three. We did one, was you, they're giving it to you. Two is you're using one to create the other, and three is you use the other to create a third. Got it. So one, two, three. All of those end up in the same place. And those were not, um, you did not label them one, two, three in, in terms of importance. No. Got it. They're, in they're just nice for you to know the growth that exists. Correct. Now, in terms of like how, what are the most common ones that you use? No. Number two. Yeah. Number you use one setup to catch. Yes. Not so much of them giving it because you're rolling more with friends. Oh, they're smarter. Two, and you don't go as far as three. As often as I go to two. As often you do it from two. But in terms of things that will happen, we mentioned final control from here is huge. But also, especially if we take someone's arm from their back, them holding hands, it probably happens, you know, 90% of the time. Now, from the guard, it's more about them holding their bicep and as he mentioned, you. and them stacking. But from the back and the mount arm bar, this right here, it, it probably happens 90% of the yes, time. Yes, I agree. 90% of the time against those that have experience that train jiu-jitsu. And we've mentioned this before uh, many times, but when we, when we land here, if I could ask all of you, from a show of hands, what is my job? Is it to break his grip, yes or no? I would imagine that 98% of you believe that my job right now is to break his grip because you believe that your job is to finish that which you've started. Yeah. But I, and the reason why I'm saying 95% is because I've asked groups of 70, 90 people, 100 people, what should I do next? And everybody says, break his grip. Now, that is not what I wanna do next. Okay, what I want to do next is, we'll put it this way. What does he want me to do next? Does he want me to hug his arm, keep my heels tight, keep my hand right here ready, and wait? Or does he want me to try fighting his grips, potentially using my foot to break his grip? 
right? Does he want me to lean and to fight this? Relax real quick. Does he want me to like, you know, keep holding hands? To like try to cross and break? Does he want me to lift my leg up and figure for his arms, right? Does, is that what he wants? Or does he want me to stay here? I prefer all the other things, but except for this. So the point is that he wants me to do anything. Because any one of those things, you guys, presumably, can give me the leak, the smallest leak that I need to slip out of here. But if he stays tight and conscious and present and patient, he's not going to move, which means it's on me. The next move is on me because my life is about to end, so I have to do something, presumably. So now, when I try to make my move, then he's going to go. So that's where, yeah. It's, it's a little bit, um, it's is, almost embarrassing, okay? How many people land here and then uh, start fighting the hands? And I'm telling you right now, the only reason why we do it is because we've agreed, we believe that it's the final objective in jiu-jitsu is to submit your partner. And right now, how close am I to submitting you, Henner? Right now you're 85%, 90%. I'm 85% if I take the approach that I'm suggesting. But if a brown belt gets Henner's arm right here and they try to break his grip, then they're like 25% mm -hmm. chance of submitting him. You see, it's much less. It's so crazy, you guys. So just, re just tell, remind yourself, every time you land here, we... The game of staying so, here. So teach us then. Now we understand the mindset. Teach us exactly what your body's doing right now during this patient waiting process that I will eventually fall victim to when I try to do literally anything. So and my my heels, my feet are tight, my feet are crossed. Sometimes they uncross. My knees are wide. He might want to keep this together and use your knuckles to push my knee off your head. Like that. Go back. When that happens, go ahead. There's a little extension little, of my legs, this, which scissor. narrows my knees, brings them together. Mm. The little extension. My head is closed and it's turned sideways. If it's normal, he doesn't attempt to pull his elbow to the ground. He can hit my face right here. People will like do a quick little hit, boom, rip their elbow to the ground. And sometimes that limp arm hits limp your arm. face. Yeah. So my head is... See which way is it looking? Okay, like that. I'm always He's at like, an angle. The little rhino horn right there, just in case. Yeah. Not a rhino horn. Got it. I just saw the way you were looking. Bull horn. Yeah. Little, he's putting this horn right here. Yes. So where if I slap, it hits his eye and forehead, not his nose and mouth. So I'm not just like this. Look at this. This is boom. asking for the yeah. hands to the face. Now, boom, turning. I'm not even pulling on his arm. He's not holding me up. I'm yeah. holding. Uh, there's me no up. tension on the rope. He's not creating tension by ripping on this. If he attempts to sit up, my hand drops to his bicep and my leg on his neck pushes his head down a little so bit. So he does uncross and momentarily. then I sit back up. That was important. As I tried to rock him, which the thing is this, when he don't sitting up and curled this tightly, he is, uh, how do I say? He I'm a ball. Vulnerable to be rolled. That's the one weakness in this position. If he stays tight and curled, it, I would, it would look like this. I would go here, and then I would go up and I would stack him up, right? Well, it's because I'm fixed. Yes. But once he rocks me and my shoulder hits the ground. So he throws his body to the ground. I connect it. to the ground and then my leg becomes uh, much heavier. And, and then, then I sit it. back up. This hand right here is not on the ground and it's not visible. I don't want him to see it, and it's not on the ground. It's here. So if it's amazing. on the ground, he'll hear it leaving the ground to grab his hand. If it's visible, he'll see it. So he needs to not, oh! He needs to not see it, hear it, feel it, smell it, nothing. That's such a good detail, you guys. And so, I don't touch. I don't touch anything early. And I'm watching his fingers, oh, his hands. Because I know that if there's no tension on his hands, I know that he's not, he knows he's in danger, but after 10, 20 seconds, you forget, and then you want to try something. He and then, well, hold on, you said it real quick. Stay here. He said something very, when he, if I know there's no tension on my hands, think about that for a second. It's the first time ever you've ever landed here and somebody wasn't pulling. See, right now there's tension, about 20, about 60%, 40%. And the more he pulls, the tighter my grip gets. So the opposite is also true. The less he pulls, the more I go, wow. If there is no one on the other end of this rope right here, maybe I can let go real quickly and accomplish something. Now what that thing is, who knows? Push the knee, sit up. But my point is I don't feel a threat because there isn't a pull on this arm, which means I'm 10 times more likely to start to do something because what's the alternative, you guys? Just stay here? And you know, if that's the case, if they just wait as patiently as you, what well, happens? Well, that's what you should do. That's what I would do. I would stay. I would not move. 
And then when you don't move, the top person now takes the bait and they say, well, he's not moving. I'm going to break the grip. Mm -hmm. So wherever we are, we become the, the waiter, the watcher. Now, finally, when we're now we're focusing on us though. When this grip breaks, <laughs> break the grip, push my knee, freeze. My hand doesn't lead. What leads is my body. So with my feet, heels on the ground, how they are, or like this, but my body does the beginning. Oh my gosh. Just grab your hand again. Can't. Try, reach. He might get near, but then my other hand comes in. It's very natural to hold hands again, that when the grip breaks, go ahead, freeze. We do this, mm. but now he re-grabs. So I need to take the arm out of range so he cannot reconnect because, and I do that not with the arm, I do that with the body. So the hands let go, but my body. And now my hand comes in for the end. So good. Okay, now we can move on. Q and A. Very, very good situation. Let me show one, since you got to show one. So he's down right here. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, start throwing in some questions. Yes, we're gonna do like maybe four to five minutes Q and A, but we're wrapping up here. And then we'll get into that and then we'll be done. We have a Gracie giveaway, another Lion Gi. You guys, someone might enter to win. So I'm sitting here. Um, one very common question we get is when, this is th there, if you take the opposite approach than what Hedon's recommending, which is not a good idea, and you decide, I'm gonna break this grip and I have to get it down. There are many grip breaks wrist locks, finger grabs, throat grabs, vibrating legs, hammer fist to the belly, many options to make a person let go and then you catch the arm, right? One of the more problematic grips is when they grab their own bicep. Grab your bicep like that. This is one of the most difficult because there's not a finger or a wrist lock to be locked right here and it's kind of hidden underneath this arm. Sometimes this leg is, hand is exposed. Sometimes they try to hide it under your hamstring, which is the most difficult for sure. Mm -hmm. Hedon is in a very, I would say he's only 10 or 20% in danger right now. 80% chance he's getting out of this situation if he knows what he's doing. Okay, so this is very bad. So if you get land here and they grab their bicep, right away, go inside again. Don't let this hand go inside. No matter what, scooping this hand, keeping it elevated right here. And then, and once you feel that you've stabilized momentarily, he's not trying to get out, but he's trying to hide his hand, go scoop it, go ahead and kind of get inside. Take out your other hand, lift it up, push it away. Put your head inside, hug the elbow. They're not gonna tap, they're gonna try to get you off their elbow. And then you switch back and catch this one. One of my favorites here. So once again, he's hugging his bicep, he's trying to get inside, go inside, you know, go inside. Don't let him, right away start going and scooping the fish right here. Like use his hand and just kind of cup the, the, the fish right here trying to go underwater, you're just holding it from going in. Don't let it, keep it from going under, take this hand out, Go two on one, double C clamps, push this away from him. Now he has no idea why you're pushing this arm away. Zero clue. The point is when they go anchor on the bicep, that arm is compromisable. I can pick it up, I can go two on one, double C clamps, and literally extend my arms away. Once you extend, pay attention, put your head in the north hole. Not here, here. And then from the head, diving in, hug at the tricep elbow area. And then I always hug a little high, and then I slide to where I know the elbow is. I can grab my collar or not, but the key is how I grab my own elbow right here to give me extra leverage. So one is hugging, one is reaffirming that hug, and now the pressure that I would put right here is gonna be hugging this to my chest very assertively, not while laying back, you're gonna lose the arm. It's a hug and it's a curl in. I'm like doing a crunch and I'm bringing this elbow to my chest. He will not tap. More often than not, they're gonna extend trying to do this and free their arm out of the equation, which is totally a viable defense. The problem is that viable defense exposes the one for what I originally wanted, which was the straight arm lock from whatever position I set it up from. So look how beautiful. Maybe we went for a cross choke. He defends the cross choke. Go my bicep. Yeah. I spun. Boom. I spun. That was a one, two. Then he went to his bicep. Bicep. Boom. Now he starts to hide. So the two, I go for the three. Boom. And then from the three, he defends and I catch the two. And, and there's, there's no risk in you letting go of your original arm around my arm. Do you understand? Like I how see. many times, because you see, he's, he has this arm I'm of hugging. his, hugging. And then he's using his hand right here to stop my hand from hiding. When he removes that arm, technically, I have no control of his inside arm with my hand, correct? Correct. Well, the thing is, because that hand, is stopping st this so well, so effectively. When your other hand, from, I'm just in shock that your hand is shadowing my hand. Yeah, he's more focusing on this. It's almost yeah. like you don't even know that my phantom arm isn't there. And I don't know because I, I really want what I want, which is bicep and leg. And this is very common. People have done, people have do this for years and years and years. So when you stop that, it's a very new, they've never experienced that. 
So oh. when you go two on one and then you lift it up, but they still don't even realize no that this arm is not being controlled by his arm. And even if they do, they can't even do much about it because his heels are tight, his hips are tight. It's a yeah. There's nowhere to go. No, no, no. It's like I'm literally like just stuck in a barrel, like a fish in a barrel. And again, I'm not showing this for any other reason. To give a little example of how the one, the two, the three, the three can go to a four, or the four, three can go back to the two. That's what's so exciting about this, you guys. But it all starts with some core principles. I think at the top of the list is this understanding he don't talk about. How when you get to the final arm lock position, it's not your responsibility to break their grip and break their arm. It's their responsibility to find a way out of the web that you've essentially trapped them in, right? That's well, it's not even their responsibility to find a way well, We out hope of that they think it is. Yes. We hope they assume the position. Because we might be them. That's true. Once you're on the bottom, it's not your responsibility. Once you're on the bottom, it's that person's responsibility to break your arm. When you're on top, it's the other person's yep. responsibility to boom. When he don't mount on me, when he don't mount on me, look, if I'm, we're talking about me, today's my class. It's his responsibility to submit me. Do you understand? It's his responsibility to catch me. It's not my responsibility to get out. If he don't, if, if I roll him and I end up in his guard, look, who's, who's responsibility? Is it my responsibility to pass the guard? Well, if you're paying attention so far, the answer is no. It's he don't's responsibility to submit me or sweep me. I'm just here to neutralize his effectiveness. The minute you take the responsibility of having to pass the guard, escape the arm lock, escape the mount, or put the onus on yourself in any position, you've already lost because you've assumed that fixed responsibility. And if you fail to accomplish that, then you failed to meet your own expectation. And that's the beginning of losing because you lost to yourself. So the safer position and the one that our grandfather assumed for how long? Right? Ever. Ever. Which is why he trained till 90 plus years old was the one, the most sustainable mindset in jujitsu is the one where you say, no, self-defense. My job is not to defeat you. My job is to prevent your progress, your effectiveness. You see? So whether you're in the arm lock getting caught or catching the arm lock, that mindset applies in both roles. It just depends on where you are on any given day or with any given training partner. But I'll tell you right this right now. When you have two people who have that mindset, it makes for a very interesting equation because you end up in some positions where his responsibility, he's deferring to me, and I'm deferring to him. It's like, no. And it's a patience game, and then, okay, 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 fine. I'm going to make a move, not because I think it's the right thing to do, but because I just want to fluff, right, shuffle the deck a little bit and keep things moving, and I'm going to risk something right now that I probably shouldn't, and then you blah, 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 and you hope for the best, and then oftentimes it ends well, up the worst. Well, and it's also because we have both won. Yeah, true. It's, we accomplished victory by recognizing the right mindsets before we deviated from them. Yes. So every role, the only question is, is in any given role, if, if somebody wants to take the responsibility of go, 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 through, 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 crush, crush, dominate, dominate, then let them have it. Mm. That's it. But most, 99% of the time, both people want that role. So what we're suggesting is that anytime somebody wants to be the person that is escaping the side mount when they want, attacking for arm bars from the side mount as they, as they please, or passing the guard, or attacking, doing, doing, the person that is doing, 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 I'm very happy to let you be the doer. I see. I'm very happy. And you're the stopper. And I'm the watcher, stopper, defender, patient. There you go. Now, the moment you say, I don't want to be the doer anymore. I'm also a watcher. Then I stopper. say, oh my gosh. Hello. I, I just passed the test. Not, well, yeah, we're just, we're the same breed. And then now I say, oh, okay, I guess I will now attack because now that everything has changed now. Now it's about me attacking you while you being the stopper to sharpen my attacks. There you and go. For so you, you're using me now. Your, now you're using it's me. It's a whole different way of there training you go. now. So if both people have the watcher, stopper, yeah. self-defense mindset, Andy Gracie, then you can deviate from that and go to use the role for a different purpose, but you pass the but test. How many people believe that they have passed that test when they really haven't? Do you understand? Yes. They, they think that they understand what we're talking about and they already start going into the attacking, acting, going, going, going. Well, first Me, of all, oh, I know how to defend if I needed to. Yes. But no. I just... No. You understand? Not about the, defending. Put it this way. There are 10, 15 position situations that we could put you in and not even put you in, but we can watch you rolling, 
to, to basically take note if you have truly adopted the belief that it is not your responsibility to act. Mm. For example, if you, if by watching you from 30 feet away without you even knowing if you're rolling with another brown belt, let's say you're a purple belt mm. and you get side mounted by a brown belt. If within the first five, 10 seconds of that brown belt side mounting you, solidifying their control, you are moving and trying to escape, check. You don't understand what we're saying. Failed. If the moment you land in their guard, within the first five, 10, 15 seconds, you're trying to pass their guard, failed. If they mount you, failed. If you mount them, you start attacking them in the first 10, 15 seconds, failed. If anywhere you land, in any position, you do anything but be in that position, it's checks, checks, checks all day. Now, not to be confused here, if someone's trying to pass your guard and you're trying to keep the guard. That's and different. They, and hold on, and they get around and they side mount, the minute they land, the second they land, you're able to strip and bring your knee inside. They never actually landed in side mount. That's guard control. That's just keeping them in the guard. We're talking about once your guard is actually passed, boom, they <laughs> landed, they parked the car on your chest and they're in side control. And in the first, after control, guaranteed official side mount points have been issued. After that, you start fighting to get out within the first five seconds. He didn't just say points, but he <laughs> meant the position has been but that, established. But I mean, there's at least some timing to say, okay, it's official, they got it, you, your guard has been passed, now let's see how you act. Yeah. And if at that moment you're going wild from the bottom, you don't understand what we're talking about here. And listen, could you be very effective at the jujitsu that you're deploying? Of course you can. Yeah, and, and there's time for that. Yes, there is time for what you're Turn saying. Turn it on and go, go, go. Right. And what, what I'm saying, what we're saying is that that is the one that by default, everybody's touching all the time. All the time, yeah. Everybody's getting mounted or landing on the bottom of the guard and going for attacks right away. And there's value in that. We believe you should do that. The problem is that th that's all you're doing. That's all you're doing. You're doing that 99% of the time. What we're saying is that half the time when you land in someone's guard or someone lands in your guard, zero attempts to submit them and then spend a whole day just keeping them in your guard. Yes, observe. And why is it important to do this? Why does it even matter? Because the day will come where someone mounts on you against your will and your spazzing 15 second escape attempt will fail. Then because it failed, you will break spiritually and emotionally and you will be your own worst enemy versus the person who was and there comfortably and by choice and with relaxation and, and deliberately and with yes. no rush to get out. You became a black belt at not getting out. You became a black belt and at just being wherever you are. And that's the most sustainable jujitsu philosophy. When we talk about longevity, everyone's talking about what they're doing now, what they can do now, how explosive and, and athletic, and how many new techniques you know right now. And that's beautiful for now. But five years from now, seven years from now, 12 years from now, when your body starts to get over the hump of what it's currently capable of, that mindset and philosophy that you've adopted right now for 99% of your training will not apply anymore. So the question is, when do you start investing in the phase of jujitsu where what you currently believe is jujitsu no longer is possible for you. <laughs> you just said um, they'll physically and emotionally beat you. Yeah, you'll beat yourself. You'll beat, you'll beat yourself. yourself. Yeah, you're done. Yeah. And that is worse than getting tapped out. If yeah. you're mentally and physically broken, you're as good as done. Yeah. They can do with you as they please. Now, and you also said in 5, 10, 15 years, you won't be able to do it the way that you're doing it but it's also in 10 minutes. You don't know who's gonna walk in the room. Yeah. You've been, let's say you're 27 years old and you are very physically fit, you have amazing motor skills. It doesn't matter because there is somebody else who's 27 years old, 26. 22 years old, yeah. or 30 years old. You have no idea who you're gonna cross paths with and they put you in a position and then all of a sudden, everything that worked for you for the last 10, 15 years doesn't work anymore. Because they're a better goer than you are. So that day came. You don't have to be 47 years old to feel the feeling of, man, I don't have a plan. Yvonne, questions? So there's a lot of engagement here, and you, you guys cover so much material that everyone's very thankful. And they don't have any questions regarding attack time lock because you guys just expanded their mind and they appreciate it. So there is a little bit of questions regarding arm lock on how to counter, how to defend even that there's so many beautiful attacks in the material. From the guardian, from the mouth. Do you guys want to share something that so they can practice? So, elbows being tucked in. Yeah. The elbows. The close. question is, are there some defensive strategies we can share regarding surviving these? And listen, the best defense is a good offense. Once you do a seminar like this, and you speak this language, and you know the three layers, the four layers that the armbar can be applied. It can be applied as a gift, 
It can be applied as a one-two punch where you go for this and catch that. It can be applied as a two-one where you go for this to go back to something else. It can be applied as a three-two, a one-two, three-two. So once you understand where they live, you know what to respect and what to avoid and what to watch out for. Mm -hmm. So you want to get really good at arm locks, you know, start doing them. And want to get good at defenses, start catching people. And that's how it was for me. Every journey that I made submission-wise, as I said, I'm going to attack Dar's chokes. Guess where I learned my Dar's, Dar's choke defenses? For every single net that I attacked, how they behaved went into a database. Even though I wasn't getting attacked, as I'm going down the Dar's mastery pathway, I'm becoming a Dar's defense master because the few successes that people were having against me, whenever they did, I would write that down and go, oh my gosh, he just defended it in the most beautiful way I've ever seen. And I didn't even do that before. I'm gonna start defending like that. So my students and my targets for my Dar's chokes were teaching me how to defend Dar's chokes. So as you start to embark on the attack journey that we're talking about with these skills that we've discussed today, you invariably will become an arm lock survival master because you're going to start knowing where all the leaks are that are going to be exploited against you. And then when you're in those defensive positions, you will also know what leaks to seek to exploit, uh, to, uh, to explore and escape with. And when you're in the defensive positions, because for example, do you want us to give you all the arm lock escapes and defenses and you know body awareness tips on positioning of your body? Do you want us to give them all to you? Or do you want to get into the position on the bottom of the mount, for example, and be under attack? And then as you're attacked, you just take note. Especially if as you're attacked, you're on the bottom of the mount with the mindset of, my goal right now is not to escape the mount. It is to observe that which my partner on top is trying to do. So I guess only through experience, we can show you two or three moves, but us showing them and them drilling what we showed is probably only 10% as powerful and as impactful as if you, then if you allow yourself to play in the arm lock range. Defensive positions, yeah. Almost purposely putting yourself in that area and letting 10, 30, 60 people over the next three, four, five, six months explore arm locks on you. Mm -hmm. Because us being teachers, how many students have you allowed to get you into an arm lock either here or here, final control? All of them. All of them. That's and how, how many arm lock tips did we learn in terms of defending arm locks from our grandfather Seven. or our father or our uncle? Five. Minimal. I would say five, ten percent of what we do today is taught to us. The majority of it, we felt it from all the time we spent Allowing there. ourselves to go there. When you do it with your student who you love and who is like a good relationship and you don't mind letting them catch you because they're your friend and your student. And or your, your training co-, co Correct. But in our case, yes. like many times it was our students' private classes. Uh, every private class is paying me, right? But yet, I'm the one using them to get better in a whole different way. at my arm lock defenses because they get in the position and I try this and I try that and I'm using them to get better for when he don't lands there. I have a new move to try that I explored and you know elaborated on with my private student in the class. Now the point wow. is you have to remove the ego and put yourself in that position and do what we call rapid mastery drilling where you focus entirely on that position and you get in the compromise, they're right there and they're ready to take your arm and you have a training partner who you love and trust and they're attacking you and you're playing and feeling all the, the exploitable weaknesses and leaks You've got to get in the position and us showing it to you almost robs you of that position. Now, emotionally, it's a lot more comforting for us to tell you because then you don't have to have someone beat you to learn it. But that, emo that emotional freedom comes at a cost. And it comes at the cost of you not getting as much growth in as little time as you would get if you were the one to put yourself in the compromised position and experience that survival. There are as many moves we can show that we learn Amen. from our own discovery, but I think we don't want to rob you of that. Yeah. We don't want to rob you of that. This, this so I could say so much more right now. Don't. Next on question. the same topic. It doesn't Great. even end. This topic doesn't end. Then let's not end it. Let's think about this. I want to give you guys one of the new... No, no, no. I want more questions. We are going to get it. We have to, you have to give it away though. The hoodie. We want, yeah. this, we want to give away a jacket. Another one. Then we gave one last week. We're going to give away one more. You Remember, want the jacket. The new Lion D collection. Check out the inside, you guys. Look at that. The Lion is right there. So when you open, you know who's getting down. Listen. And then right here, we talked about this last time. Look at this. We can see right here. When it comes to chokes, there are no tough guys. Everyone goes to sleep. Eddie Gracie, Lion D Collection. 
We're gonna hook you up with your line gi. Okay, let us know. I mean, and, how comfortable um, is that gi right there? Huh? I've never even worn it. I forgot I was wearing it. But this one right here is very comfortable. It's a, this, yeah, it's, it's very much the same. This, this is like, it's ridiculous. Like, do you, people always write like, what's the most comfortable gi? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my question is, have no. you ever worn like an uncomfortable gi? Like, how often does that happen? Especially these I days. Don't know. Listen, to enter to win right now, we want to know how long you've been training and what CTC you train at. Put your CTC location, put your training years, and we're going to enter to win. We're going to choose someone right now. We're going to choose someone right now. Don't train at a CTC. You can see, then you can write how much you appreciate us. You can just write how much you appreciate this amazing seminar. Um, but the gift is going to go to a CTC student somewhere in the world because we love and we appreciate all the CTCs for helping us spread jujitsu in a way that is very special to and Gracie University. Yeah. The Gracie University family. Okay. And many of you don't train at CTCs, but they're still amazing. They, they have a Gracie garage. That's right. They're still part of the Gracie University organization. People are learning on GracieUniversity.com, training at a school that isn't a certified training center. Yes. So the Grace University family goes way beyond CTCs, but right now we're on the CTC list. And more important, was there any other Q and A's that you can think no, of? No, but they need some more philosophy while I check this out. You guys entering name, training, and training years and CTC location. While well, he don't gives you guys a little more deep philosophy, we appreciate you guys coming well, in today. Back to defending arm exciting. locks. In terms of defending arm locks, there there are proper ways. Remember the whole one two go for a choke to get the arm. There are proper ways to both defend the choke and keep the arm safe. This whole one, two of going for the neck to get an overreaction to isolate the arm, that's because you're defending the cross choke incorrectly. So this information is out there. And those of you that train at certified training centers that are learning on GracieUniversity.com, this information in terms of the proper hand positioning to defend your neck and not expose your neck is there. So. I, but I think when people ask for arm lock counters, you want deep end, deep, deep trouble. The very end of the arm lock, the grip is being broken, your arm is being extended. Those are usually the defenses that we want. Those are usually the situations that we want defenses for, which makes sense. It's the same as people in the world. They don't want to know how to eat healthy to avoid diabetes or lifestyle choices to avoid cancer and diabetes. They wanna know once they have cancer, what are our options, what can we do, right? So we wanna think, right? Our grandfather was always somebody, I would say, Grandpa, you know, what do I do to defend this submission? He would say, hit him, stop. Take it back three, four, five steps. Had this even go wrong? What, what was the tipping point, right? Where did this begin to go wrong? Let's not talk about the very end when we're already, you know, 10 feet deep in the submission. No, where, what was the decision that you made five, 10 seconds ago that resulted in you ending up where we are right now? So those are the type of things that you will become aware of when you do what? When you land in positions and you truly, truly behave in a way to where you don't have to do anything but watch and control and prevent progress and just have awareness. It's difficult to be, I guess, be um, in tune with how you got to where you got when you're fighting and you're resisting the position of the mount, for example. When you're saying, I should not be on the bottom of the mount, I have to get out of here now, you have no idea how you landed up deep in the arm lock. But if when someone mounts you, you say, oh, okay, they're mounted on me. Let's see what they have in store for me. Let me just stay right here. You have so much awareness that when they force your arm out of its safety and then they take the arm, that experience that was taken, and then what happens? It happens again and then again. And 17 times later, you become very aware of the three or four ways that people are getting your arm out of that safe spot. And then before you know it, it doesn't happen anymore. And we have seen this. We've been training jiu-jitsu for so long that I have seen students of mine of three, four, five years, get caught in something 20, 30, 40 times, and then I don't catch them anymore. So how can I catch someone in something 40, 50, 60 times, let's say that they're a blue belt, mm -hmm. purple belt, mm -hmm. and now I don't catch them anymore. It's only one way, it's because they brought a certain awareness to that position, to that discussion, to that battle. 
So you need to do that on your own without us telling you, without us putting you in the same position 30, 40, 50 times, you put yourself there. How many times have you ever rolled with somebody and guillotined them seven times? Yes. Easy, I, as easy I, every time as time before. I've rolled with somebody and I've footlocked them five times, seven times. I've triangled them from the mount five times in one roll. What does that tell us? Triangles from the mount and side mount. They're not there. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. But what is that? There depends. <laughs> they can very much be there and still be getting outsmarted. And the only way that we know is if we do it again four days later, nine days later. And when we do it again, some people, there's a feeling of like embarrassment. There's a feeling of, there's an anger, there's a resistance to that. But then to some, there is a, a laugh and a fascination with, man, how can it happen again and again? There's a little more of a, a little more of a, there, a little more light approach to that behavior, that treatment to them. Mm. And then when that treatment happens, that type of personality that says, this is unbelievable, uh, and they laugh at it, they're more likely to, on the ninth day, 14th day, what happens? They go from getting tapped three, four, five times mm. to one or two times because they're not, they're not, um, their judgment and their understanding is not being clouded by the anger and the emotions. People actually, have you ever had somebody say, I don't understand how you're tapping me so much? Yeah, all the time. Which isn't it crazy how a blue, have they been blue belts before? Yes. How can, a, how can a blue belt or a purple belt not understand how you tap them six times in the same submission? You're saying they should be able to. No, no. How can they not understand how it's possible? Right. Well, what would you expect anything less? I see. So when somebody who's so much more experienced taps you five, six, seven times, don't sit in, this is unacceptable that somebody beat me seven times. Right. Sit in, of course they beat me seven times. They've been training for... 30 years, of course you get triangled six times in a row. I don't understand how you, who's been training for three years, are confused <laughs> that 30 years can't beat you seven times. Who do you think you are? You understand? Now, when you change that and you say, of course he beat me seven times. Let me see how he's doing it. And you fully accept it. Oh my gosh. Then, all of a sudden, have you ever had a blue belt? not get guillotined once in five minutes, survive your guillotines. An yes. advanced blue belt. Yes, once they learn it. Yes, so yes. Now, then, then you have to ask the other question, is how can you roll with the blue belt for five minutes and not beat him? Right. Brother, what's wrong with you, brother? Yeah. You're not representing black belts. Right. What's wrong with you? Do you see that? But I don't say that, why not? Because I understand the steps and the process that that blue belt took to stop your guillotines. It has nothing to do with you and your lack of guillotine understanding or your inability right. to tap people. It has everything to do with the work that they put in to read the early, early, early indicators that show you want a guillotine. Right. You see that? So put yourself there, play in the position. We did the footlock chapter here. Yes. We did the footlock chapter three weeks ago, two weeks ago. I said, purposely leave your feet out dangling under somebody's arm. Who does that? Thank you. You don't do that. And the reason why you don't do that is because you care more about the end result of that role than your greater understanding of footlock defense. Dang. That's why. That's deep. And that applies to every submission, obviously, yeah. including today's. We have a winner, Pete Malinke, five months. He's been training at the CTC in Delaware. It's uh, Bushido Academy with our, Smyrna, Delaware, with our good friend Howard Steele, a great black belt, a great instructor, even greater human being. And uh, congratulations, Howard, to all the great work. And congratulations, Pete Malinke, of five months, still a white belt, cranking away. You're going to be a dope white belt with the nicest new lion gi, so you're straight. We're going to send it out. Howard, reach out. Let me know his size and um, where to ship it, and we'll take care of you guys. It's not out yet, it'll only be out like maybe two more months, two or three months, so when the Lion Gi is released, Howard, that's when you can let me know, yo, Henner, he's ready, Pete won, and we'll take care of you guys. Everyone else, today is our last formal live webinar of this series, and uh, we're wrapping it up because starting next week, we're kicking into a full, full-fledged Zoom schedule, right? Two-way video conference Zoom schedule for all of our programs for adults and children. Combatives, Gracie Combatives, Gracie Bullyproof, Master Cycle, Women Empowered, all age groups, all the classes. 
and we're going for it. And the beauty is, this is primarily for our students in Torrance, actual live students and active students at Grace University headquarters in Torrance. And we're gonna go for it, you guys. We're gonna have a crazy, full-on Zoom schedule, and we're gonna accomplish growth in the categories that were often neglected in regular group class frequency, right? When we just come in and go through the motions. We're talking about micro movements, macro movements, mobility, mindset, things that we would like to give more time to, mm -hmm. even in group classes that we never did. Now, we don't have a choice, so we're gonna tackle those. There's no partner requirement to do these classes that we're gonna do on the Zoom sessions. If it's there, great, but they're gonna be designed for you to move the coffee table, get down, and have fun with us 100%. So this is going down starting Monday, and it's gonna continue until the foreseeable future until jujitsu schools in our region are safe to open up once again, you know, while following, you know, social distancing and, you know, safety requirements set forth by the local government. And all CTCs have been instructed to do the same thing. So they've been equipped and recommended with the whole revised curriculum that requires no partner to see the growth and to make the progress from home through these two-way video conferences yes. facilitated by Zoom. And I'm so excited because I guess I, I can't see myself showing any solo movement, teaching any solo movement that I don't believe that has value. You understand? Everything I show, I'm gonna show you only because we understand that the small movements in jujitsu are what make up the big movements. So this is a time for, it's almost like this, this time will never happen again. Yes. This time yes, yeah. of discussing jujitsu from this perspective, these considerations, these small movements that we can practice, who knows, things might go back to normal in two, three months, and then no in four months, no we have no idea. No one's doing solo, no. micro, macro mobility, they skip all this. We, we will do it like 10% of the time. Yes. So the depth at which we can dive in terms of what can be done by yourself, it will never go so deep as it goes right now. It will never go so deep and so, so robust. And yeah. there is no doubt that some people don't have it in them. Right? They're just like, oh, you know what? I can take five months of no jujitsu. Right. And then some, they say to themselves, no. Well, man, I, they're also curious. I wonder what is possible in a group setting with he don't being able to see me or the instructors being able to watch me. I wonder what is possible. And if growth is possible, I want to keep growing. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that some are curious so that I'm excited for those sounds. There you go. And these are so legitimate, you guys, that when students do these Zoom sessions, these two-way Zoom sessions, they're gonna get credit for the class that we do because mm -hmm. our programs are very curriculum driven, right? We know what we're gonna teach every day of the week, every program is dialed in. So when someone comes and does Gracie Combatives lesson number four, we're gonna get their Gracie Combatives card and we're gonna check it off for them having done it on Zoom from a distance, two-way, because we're seeing them do it. And they're growing in that class in a way that we can't even and probably won't do when we're all partnered up with partners and doing it in a group setting. So it's actual class credit for our live students. Currently, we're only doing this for Torrance active students who are on the roster and active right now as we speak. We're very excited to deploy this, but those thousand plus students are the ones who are gonna have access initially. Depending on how much demand there is, we may consider adding more classes to allow people who don't live in training Torrance full time to join in on these two way video conferences deployed from Gracie University headquarters. So if this sounds exciting to you, email Jackie at GracieUniversity.com and let her know. Say, hey, I wanna get on the list. I wanna get on the list for the Zoom lineup. I wanna, if they open the door, I wanna get in and we'll talk about how we can make that possible. There will be a fee for this, obviously, but it's gonna be legit. And if you're somewhere where you're jujitsu 100%, but you simply can't feel that fire either because you don't have a partner or because your instructor isn't offering this type of service. Reach out, talk to Jackie, get on the list, and let's talk about getting you in. Give us some time, give us a few weeks, but it's very likely that we open up some possibility, at least for select people, and we're gonna start at the top of the list and then work our way down, so reach out. And we just announced this today, so if you get in now, you'll probably still make the list. Jackie at GracieUniversity.com. Jackie, she's, J A C K I E. Correct. And she's going to take care of you, add you to the list, she'll re email you back. It's legit communication from this point out. Zoom sessions here, CTCs all over the world. Thank you guys for everything you guys have done up until now. Get cracking on those Zoom sessions. Your students are going to love them, and we can't wait to hear the feedback from all over the world. Thank you guys for joining us today. Hopefully, your arm bars went up like. <laughs>
You know, if you're on this rung of the ladder, you got to this rung. If you're on this rung, you got to that rung. And if you're already black belt mastery, armbar master of the world, we can't wait to meet you. Thank you guys. We'll see you next time here.